Pleasant, good morning to all our viewers and listeners out there. We are here again. It's another Tuesday morning, and we are here with you for another Pastor's Corner. We are delighted that our early birds are there waiting on us. We really appreciate that, um, and that is from our heart because, of course, if I looked on the screen and I saw no one, I would be wondering who exactly is listening to us. Who is viewing us? So <laughs> we're delighted to see um, a number of you already there. And we are happy to see um, Mr. Anita, um, Mr. Alicia, Veronica, Mr. Ferguson, all of you who normally they're very early. We are happy to see you for another Pastor's Corner. Well, um, we are here again this morning looking at the, 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 the topic, Stemming the Tide, How to Improve Family Relations. Um, last week we spoke a little about family, but um, this week we are, we are actually diving into it. How to improve family relation. And um, you, you, in a moment you'll be given the opportunity to interact with us as well, asking questions. So let's, as we, before we go any way further, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here at another Pastor's Corner. We thank you for viewers and listeners who are normally there. We pray for them. And as they share the link and remind the friends about this important program, we pray that today's program will be a tremendous blessing to each one of us. This is our prayer. We ask for thanksgiving in Jesus' name. So we are here this morning, and um, I have with me to deal with this very stemming the tide, this very important um, subject topic area how to improve family relation family um, families are disintegrating at an alarming rate and um, we want to ensure that we share bits and pieces tips how to improve family relation so I have two competent um, pastors with me um, first of all to my immediate left is Pastor Charles Gittins Pastor Charles Gittins is a pastor of the Northeastern District Pastor, greet the viewers and listeners. Uh, pleasant good morning to you, Pastor Enoch, and pleasant good morning to all of you who are listening to Pastor's Corner at this time. May God's blessings continue to be with you as we interact today. Thank you, Pastor Giddens. Pastor, I, I don't know, I think you, you are preaching in a series. I find the, the voice a little husky. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I know sometimes when you preach and you 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 know for a long extended time, it you know causes a little hoarseness in the voice. But Pastor, we hope that maybe it's too many funerals, man. Oh, it's funerals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, uh, see, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's preaching, but not necessarily a series. A series of funerals. <laughs> sometimes two a week. <laughs> Have mercy. <laughs> All right, and to my to my um, extreme left. Is the uh, executive secretary of the Grenada Conference, um, Pastor Oliver Scott. Pastor Scott, greet the, the viewers and listeners this right. morning. Thank you so much, Pastor Isaac, and uh, pleasant good day to all of you viewers. Um, it's a privilege to have you with us and also to share with you. I know that you will be tremendously blessed and empowered in your family life as we share together. God bless each of you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. All right, thank you. So we are the bat with um, our greetings from both pastors, Gittins and Scott. And we, we get it right on the way, stemming the tide, how to improve family relation. Um, you know, and I think we, we, it's good to start off with a definition, uh, pastors. Um, so when we speak of family, when we speak of family, um, who or what, Pastor Scott, who or what are we referring to? When we talk about family. So I, I, I'll give a, a short and to the point definition. Mm -hmm. um, when we come, what family has to do with a group of persons tied by marriage and blood relations. So by marriage and blood relations. And it harmonizes with what the Bible teaches because when we look at a family in the Bible, we have husband, wife, parents, children. And so the concept of husband, wife, parent, children would comprise the family unit. So tied through marriage and blood. Tied through marriage and blood. Pastor Gittins, marriage and blood. But we have, um, we have, you know, women, two women getting married, two men getting married. You know, 
family, <laughs> is it? Uh, well, well, Pastor, tying, tying in with Pastor Scott's definition, um, I go straight to the Word of God, and the Bible points out in Genesis chapter 1, 26. God said, let us make man in our own image. And in the verse, it says, male and female created he them. Uh, then in Genesis chapter uh, 2, I noticed that God brought Eve, a female, to Adam, a male. And God it is who was the first marriage officer in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in Genesis chapter 1 and verse uh, 27, uh, verse 28, God blessed them and he said he allowed them and gave them permission to multiply or to reproduce. I said all of that to point out uh, that a male, Adam, and a female, Eve, uh, was God's ideal uh, for a family. That's how God, God is the one who invented the family. And he it is who put together a male and a female with the ability to get children. Uh, that's biblical, and so that's how I will point out uh, a family should be. That's Pastor. ideal and that's biblical. Okay, Pastor Scott, you want to add something? Yes, th th definitely. So in terms of the definition um, given, so we must harmonize with the Bible. And of course, I mentioned marriage and blood. But we know within the society context now, we have different types of, of families and definitions for different types of families, like blended family, of course, the nuclear family, extended family, and, and all of that. Once, once these definitions do not contradict the Bible, then we can work with it. For okay. example, you have adoption taking place as well, where um, husband and wife may adopt children mm -hmm. and... Uh, parent them in, in that mm -hmm. regard legally so we can work with it but any definition that would contradict the teachings of the bible we have to stay clear from it in terms of what we promote so therefore we cannot have a situation where we have two males and we call it a family or or we have two females meaning in a marital context yeah. even though it might be legal or two females in a, a legally marital context according to the state have um, parenting children according to the state um, these are things that we need to make it very clear that they do not harmonize mm -hmm. with what the bible promotes and what the bible promotes as the, the family and the ideal family wonderful and that that's important because i'm um, here the, the the topic stemming the tide how to improve family relations you see so um, we are not here to bash any, any, uh, any persons in society, but that's important because we are here as pastors. And, um, you know, we didn't discuss that, but I can... Two women comes, let's suppose, Pastor Gittes, Pastor Scott, two women come to you and, and say they're having problems. You know, they, they come for counseling. They, they're having problems, Pastor Gittes. Um, in the, they would like you to give them tips as to how to improve that relationship. Not two sisters, you know. You know, <laughs> I don't want two women married. Um, we don't have persons here um, in the uh, country, lots of Grenada, persons cannot marry. But I mean, you know, it's a tourist destination. Persons come mm -hmm. and they're, they're on island and they come to you and they would like tips as to how to improve their family relationship. Two men married, you know, um, can, we, can we provide that? <laughs> you know, that, that's because I'm saying persons may figure, yes, they are human beings. And, and yes, they are human beings, but would we, would we be able to give them tips as to how to improve that, that living arrangement? No, certainly I can't. <laughs> I, I can't. Um, <laughs> Pastor Giddens, you're stunned. <laughs> Pastor, Pastor uh, well, yeah, you stunned me with that. Because <laughs> somehow, like, like um, uh, over the years of ministry, I'm dealing with husbands and wives, or it could be not husband and wife, a live home, male and female, uh, in a situation and i'm quick and willing to help that uh that arrangement to work out because if it's a male and female they're not married i'm thinking that in terms of helping them later on i can assist them in terms of getting them married because marriage is the biblical thing it's the correct thing it's the godlike thing to do marriage is honorable but when you're hitting that they know you set me thinking you leave me speechless uh 
However, you know, these individuals, I the first thing I may want to do is to point out to them that what they are doing is going against God's word and against what God promotes as a family. That is what I may want to do. Uh, somebody may laugh at me and mock at me, but somehow that is what I may want to do. Well, of course. I may not want to willingly help two individuals who are living in a sinful situation to tell them to continue doing that. That's right, that's right. That came off the top of my head. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, naturally, naturally so. You cannot help someone yeah. to continue to sin. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're moving on. Um, Pastor Scott, I'll come at you again. Um, you know, can you please explain the importance, Pastor Scott, of, of a functioning family in today's society? What, what's the... I mean, what's the big thing about a, a good functioning family in today's society? Yes. Now, the family is, is key. The family is really like the bedrock of the society. Bedrock. Uh -huh. and, uh, and so, when the family functions you know, with efficiency and in a, a proper way, every aspect and facet of society benefits. So, for example, if the family is within the ideal will of God, you find that the school benefits because the children from that family, they will go to school and they will interact and socialize with teachers and other children. And so the school benefits. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only by the good interaction, but by the, the power of influence also. Um, the church will benefit when the family functions well because the church will comprise of different families you find the, the community of the village, the nation at large, um, will benefit through the good functions of a family. So when it comes to the benefit of fam proper family function, um, it affects every facet of society. And so therefore it's important and we have to give um, diligent attention to ensuring that family relationships um, run well, they're ideal, so that they can fulfill the purpose of God upon the earth. Sure. Pastor, you want to, you want to add something to that? In terms of, uh, Pastor Scott is right when he spoke about the family being the bedrock. I may stick in the word foundation of proper society and communities. Uh, now to add, when, let me just jump at something. Let's look at crime. Uh, when you interact with individuals, who run afoul with the law. On many occasions, and let me just single out young men, on many occasions, when you trace the family background of these individuals, uh, they are growing up in a home, sometimes with a single parent mom. Now, a male as head of a household assists a lot in terms of stemming and stopping crime because a male who is led by God, God-fearing person, living in a household and holding his responsibility as head of that household, those young men growing up within that home, he teaches them by precept and example how to utilize time properly. Uh, he passes on skills to these individuals. We're not, not the male alone, I'm just singling out. And by doing that, that stable family who has a male as head of the household, that, that stable family is helping to stop crime because idle time is not a part of the family life of those young people. So I just, I just chose to single out that one. All right. right. So I think we are agreeing here. And, and, and those of you in the chat can also, in fact, um, just have a comment there. I think I want to take that from Travis. The family is the main driving force on how effective a society is run. All problems that are in society today is based on significant problems within the family. And you, you couldn't have said it better. Um, Brother Travis, um, so, and I think that's what the point Pastor Scott and Pastor Giddens have submitted today, the importance of the family unit. Um, foundation was used, the, the, the term bedrock was used, um, which, you know, um, connotes the same meaning, meaning that the family is very important. If we ignore the family, 
we're really ignoring or we, 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 we will see the disintegration. And that leads me to my next question, Pastor Giddens. What are some of the things that threatens the disintegration? I use a strong word here. Or the annihilation of the family. Total destruction of the family. What are some of the things that threatens the, you know, the, the family's um, you know, existence, very existence? Um, I, I attempt to answer that question by pointing out that in today's society, we have too much information. Information. Too much, too much information. Uh, what am I saying? I'm saying that people are no longer, people no longer have, let's, let's point out this, this here. Families should run where individuals are getting up and they have family worship. They're praying to God, reading God's word, getting stories from God's word, and applying it to their family lives that will assist the family in running better. I point out, I said earlier, too much information. Everybody, every Tom Dick Harry wants to say how to run a family. Uh, people on TikTok, and you, you, you name it. And what... What is their rule book? The rule book is just try out something. In terms of running a family, families will disintegrate if people grabbing at different information from all about to run the family. So that's why I pointed out too much information. The next thing that causes families uh, to disintegrate is because with the coming of devices and the, the internet, People want to put their story out there in terms of the status and what negative is happening to the family. And you know that when you put out what negative is happening to the family, again, everybody is going to comment, not with the intention of assisting the family to run well, but in terms of pulling aside. The more individuals within families uh, that you allow to be included in a conflict situation, the more difficult it is uh, to run and to settle that conflict. So I say, hey, stop listening to every person in terms of helping to run the family. And let us go back to family worship, reading God's word, listening to religious individuals who take the instruction from God's word, uh, uh, coming back to prayer when there are situations. Uh, that's the better way to stop the family from disintegrating. That, that's how I choose to look at it. Okay, Pastor Scott, what, what, uh, what, are, what are some of the, um, the things that threatens the very existence of the disintegration of families? Yes. One, I would firstly say the, the omission of the, of the God factor. The omission of the God factor in the family. The Bible says, except the Lord build a house, mm -hmm. the labor in vain that build it. Mm -hmm. So God is the one that instituted and established the family. And you cannot have a successful family except God is blessing, guiding, and leading. So when we are living in a day and age where people omit the God factor. Um, there's a lack of fear of God. Um, there's a lack of persons, you know, seeking to be spiritual and connected to God. And when you leave out God in parenting, in the marriage, and in the family life, then you have the family existence and the effective function uh, being greatly threatened. Because except the Lord build the house. The Bible is saying that our best efforts are in vain. It means, therefore, that if we allow God, the God factor to be first and foremost in our families, we, God would bless us to have successful, well-functioned family. The second thing um, is that of the de-emphasis in terms of biblical morals, values, virtues, and principles. Um, persons seem to be living their lives now, even in the family context, based on societal influences rather than on the biblical influences, the virtues, the values, the principles of the Bible. And when we leave off the principles of the Bible and we base our lives and our families on what society says or what a university says or what a psychologist says, then you would find that there will be a breakdown in 
family life. Also, the, 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 the present movement of the LGBTQIA, you know, <laughs> all of the letters, that is also a great threat to, to the family because now you have persons um, not understanding their identity and uh, how God made them and who God made them to be. Um, you have the mix-up of, of the sexes in terms of person's mind. Um, you have a situation where persons want to have same-sex parenting, same-sex marriage. You know, this adds to confusion, and it causes people to depart from what God promotes in his word for the ideal family. And, and those things will affect function of family. So that is also a great threat in terms of family life and family living. And so these three things, I think they're very significant. Also technology. While technology is good and can be a blessing to the family, technology can also be a great threat if it's not managed well because the time and attention that you should be given to each other, um, you are exposed to so much negatives through the technology, even the loss of family time. And that can also be a great threat to family existence and family f function. So we have to manage the use of the technology um, well and wisely so that it benefits the family and it doesn't undermine the family. Yes, wonderful. And, and of course, viewers and listeners, you can share. Um, to you know, you're saying I would say an unwillingness to forgive. Persons are holding on to past hurts and the family cannot move forward. We need to learn to let go and let God. Wonderful. And, and others of you can share what are some of the things that threatens the family. But very important responses here from both Pastor Giddens and, um, and, and Pastor Scott. Because as Pastor Giddens said, information. Well, you know, information is good. But overload of information. And then person not knowing, as you said, what information to choose. Is there just grabbing into anything. And as you said, Pastor Giddens, uh, this, this trend of persons... Um, <laughs> You know, you know, you get up in the morning and you, you just go to Facebook and you know what people have for breakfast. Mm. You, you know if they're upset today because they say something about their husband. You know, that kind of wildness. Um, you know, um, and I'm not sure what's the benefit of that. And as um, Pastor Scott did mention that, uh, that one too, which is really threatening the very existence of what we know to be the family. This, this, um, this um, <clears throat> the LBGTQIA <laughs> movement because they, they are seeking to redefine you know, the Bible has defined what a family is, and they are seeking to redefine. So, you know, schools, the teachers are not under pressure. Or, or little children do not know what is the correct thing um, um, to, 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 to believe. And what to teach. You have to be careful in certain places what, what you say. Because um, as a teacher, because you could be held accountable. Um, you know, um, so these are the things that threaten the very existence of the family. And for, um, for those of us, you know, Christians and believers of the Bible... Then there are other issues, as was mentioned, uh, the, the non-forgiveness and all of that, because the family is threatened on different, different, different um, levels. Um, you know, even within the house of God, the family, Pastor, Pastor Scott mentioned the, 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 the time. We are there, we are home, but we are on our various devices. So we are present, but we, we're, not, we, we're not talking, you know, because we are, we are on our devices. And that, of course, is threatening family time. So... Um, you know, believers, non-believers, whoever is listening and viewing, we have to do what we, we, we have to do and what the, we, what the word requires of us to do to ensure that we maintain the family. So, we move it on. Um, what biblical advice or principles can you share as it relates to family effectiveness? Is there anything from the, the Bible, a good example or uh, something, you know, that we can share um, as it relates to family effectiveness? You know? Pastor Giddens? Effectiveness, family effectiveness, what jumps out at me, Pastor, Pastor Enoch, <clears throat> right away is the way we communicate within families. And a text jumped at me right away, Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 1, which says, A soft answer turn it away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. Uh, within, within family systems, we communicate all the time. Uh, whether it is parents and children, whether it's husbands and wives. And sometimes when anger gets hold of an individual, they sometimes want to talk to the partner or the children 
as if it's a common breed dog they refer to. Have mercy. We have to be very careful about this. We are domiciled and living under the same roof. Uh, during the night, certain things can happen where I need the assistance of my child or of my wife. So I want to zero in right there in terms of how we talk, how we speak, how we communicate with our partners and within, uh, with, with those individuals we domicile with. Uh, things like telling a child you're stupid, uh, you know, describing them in negative ways. Uh, you do this often enough and you, 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 you kind of you kinda say to the child, even though I, I hate you doesn't come out of your mouth. It's as if you're saying that. You do that often enough and the child may not want to even stay with you, right? Uh, husband, wife. So, so I'm saying let's begin right there in terms of how we communicate with the people within our homes. Keep one right to say, keep your words soft because sometimes you may have to swallow it. But Pastor Giddens, right? let me just stop you there. Yeah. Um, mm. Well, interject, not stop. Mm. Yeah. But a soft answer it turns away right but how how does a um a wife respond softly when she's been accused by her husband of lying and having an next relationship and she knows that that is there's no even a semblance of truth to that and he's calling her names and and she's supposed to respond softly how is she how is she supposed to respond softly you, you jolt me there but even though you jolt me past um you, you caused me to jump to something. In terms of a husband accusing a wife of relationship, adulterous relationship, um, what I teach is that within families, people need to trust one another. In term, and trust is built based on honesty repetitively on a daily basis. In, in, in the case you're pointing out, the husband-wife relationship. Uh, people jump to conclusions when on many occasions I don't trust you. So we come back, we come back to what I'm saying in terms of communicating on a daily basis and communicating truth with my partner. I may not, uh, I would say right away, the wife should not even answer, but seek to provide facts because throwing gasoline on fire, there is there is a more brilliant or brighter flame. So I'm saying that uh, retorting with course or call name when your husband is doing that doesn't quite that situation. That situation needs for you to sit and provide the relevant information necessary. Uh, Pass uh, the, the, the thing I was um, going towards too in terms of uh, biblical principles uh, is, is in terms of how we how we settle conflicts. Uh, conflicts within homes can break up homes and people always need to seek to get the truth out of a situation than to jump to conclusions. Let me, let me pause. There okay. Pastor Scott. Scott has yes. to add. Yeah. Yeah, so in terms of biblical principles for effective families, love is the overarching principle and uh, love is a fundamental Bible principle. In fact, the Bible says God is love. And so therefore, when it comes to effective family, there must be love, right? Um, parents loving children, children loving parents, spouses loving each other, um, agape love. The Bible teaches us what love is like. It's patient, it's kind, it does not um, provoke. It, love does not seek its own. It's not selfish and self-centered. And when we practice these, not, not just have it in theory, mm -hmm. say, I love you. Anybody could say that. Mm -hmm. But we, we practice these, then, these principles, then we would find that the family will function more effectively. Along with that, using the Bible, prayer is also critical. Um, we need to pray to God and depend upon God for help in the family. And prayer is not just an abstract concept. Prayer is real, mm -hmm. and God literally answers prayers. Pastor, let me just interject. When, yes. when, when someone says to you, they're too vexed to pray. What do I mean? What do I mean? <laughs> <laughs> they're so vexed, they say, I can't pray. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> well, in, in, to, in terms of, of that, that, that's where the principle, of again, of the Bible, which is self-control. That's another principle of the Bible, um, self-control or, or, or discipline. When we have self-discipline, self-control, in spite of how we may be feeling emotionally, we are able to say to ourselves that notwithstanding how I feel, God is still real, he's still love, and I can still go to him to help and to intervene in my situation. So sometimes when it comes to praying, um, we do not pray just based on how we feel from an emotional standpoint, but based on the principle that God is real and that he literally answers prayer. So, so prayer is critical in terms of helping your family to function effectively. Forgiveness is another biblical principle that must take place in the family because no one in the family is perfect. Mm. Um, each one will do something wrong that will offend the other. And if the family is going to move forward, it cannot move forward on reverse gear. So therefore, family members, on a point of principle, must forgive each other if the family is going to function effectively. Parents have to forgive children. Children forgive parents. Spouses forgive um, each other. And that principle is critical as well. Um, using the Bible, the Bible tells us there's a time for everything under the sun. So too, when it comes to the family, time must be given for everything. Meaning, we have to give time for recreation, time for the children, spouses given time for each other, time for romance, time for sexual activity, time for everything that is going to be of benefit to the family. If not, then we can live a life that is not very balanced within the family and it can affect negatively the effect, negatively the function of the family so that the family doesn't function effectively. And um, I'm just going to give a few more mentorship. The Bible itself teaches that, you, that we should teach our children as we wake up, as we go by the way as we lie down. Um, it's important that we follow that principle so that parents fulfill a mentorship role when it comes to their children. Don't just leave it for the teachers. As father and, and mother, um, we have the responsibility to mentor um, our children. The help meet principle, mm -hmm. be of help to each other, be a blessing to each other, so that your wife, 10 years after, is saying, thank God for him. The husband is saying, thank God for her. Parents saying thank God for the children. The children saying thank God for my parents because um, there's a help meet principle where you are blessing um, to the other to the other person. The Bible talks about it's not good for the man to be alone. So we want to avoid loneliness in the family because even though you live in the same house, there can still be loneliness. Yeah. And uh, and so you have to bear that in mind. And the and the last thing that I'm gonna say, using the Bible to, for effective family function is that of companionship. Um, we need to ensure that husband and wives, you are friends, and, uh, and have that friendship also for the entire family. Even though children are children, you still want to have that good relationship because when you read the Bible, companionship is critical when it comes to the spousal relationship and by extension, the family relationship. Once we follow these biblical principles, I think we're good to go. Yeah, wonderful. So we get in... <laughs> You know, viewers and listeners, the Bible, the Bible, whenever we move away from the Bible, we, we fall in all kinds of trouble. And when we, whenever we take in our own feelings, and I think a lot, a lot that is happening in families is that people are acting ne not necessarily, I'm talking about Christians now, not necessarily on what the Bible says. People are acting based on how they feel. They feel they should, even, even if they know that that is not supported by the Bible, but they will proceed because that's how they feel. But a relationship, a family, good re family relationship cannot be maintained based on feelings. So we have to go the Bible way. We said, Pastor Scott, you're accepting the greetings from, from Sister Teresa George mm -hmm. from, from Dominica. We're seeing that there. Of course, um, Sir Chidan say, it's hard to keep, uh, that should be silence. Mm -hmm. Um, I suppose you say when if someone if, if the spouse has been called names, how do you <laughs> how do you keep quiet when you know you are innocent, you know? <laughs> but, but I think that's where you have to. Look. So at this time we'll take a we'll take a little break um, and we'll have a special rendition of music from the um, students from the um, Grenada SDA Seventh Adventist Comprehensive School. Um, just take a break and we'll have a special item of music and then we'll be back with more on this subject. Okay. 
well. That the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt. Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart? Not because of who I am. But because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wind tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. Who am I that the eyes have seen my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out to the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, yet today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling. Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading, yet today and gone tomorrow. A wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you. Hear me when I'm calling, Lord, you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? We are back with you and Pastor Scunner. I hope you enjoy that rendition from the, the young stars at the comprehensive school um, as they sang for Jesus and continue to sing for Jesus. We have been discussing here with Pastor Gittins and Pastor Scott stemming the tide. That is how to improve family relations. What tide is that? We are trying to stem the tide of family disintegration. Um, we have established that the family is, is, you know, single most important unit within our society. But the family is under pressure from many fronts um, and is disintegrating fast. Um, so we have been sharing, Pastor Scott and Pastor Giddens have been blessing us here with some tips as to how to maintain. There's one thing I, <coughs> I would like to say, even before we, as we proceed, is that we must be willing to accept ad good advice. You see, because all of these things could be said. Um, good friends say things to us. Counselors say things to us. We get information from sermons. 
Um, but if you are determined to do what we want, then of course we will not be able to stem the tide. So we must be able to, we must be willing to listen to the word of God and follow the instructions. Um, what are some practical steps, Pastor Scott? Um, practical things we can do to ensure uh, we maintain and improve family relationship among siblings. I'll ask you, um, uh, you know, among siblings, what, what are some practical things um, siblings can use to ensure that they main good, maintain good relationship? Yes. In, in terms of the sibling re relationship, it's, it's, it's very important that siblings operate as a, as a team, that they, they be team spirit. So whether it be five of you, four of you, you must operate as, as a team where you work together, you play together, you spend time together, you look out for the benefit of each other. Um, no one is seeking to outdo the other person. And that is going to help with the, with the relationship because we had a different situation in the story of Joseph and his, his siblings. And we saw how that unfolded um, in terms of the rivalry, you know. So there has to be that um, synergy that must be fostered among the siblings. Um, but, but for me, along with what the siblings must do to foster a good relationship, parents would also contribute greatly to the kind of relationship that siblings would have among themselves. So parents also must avoid being biased in favor of one child against the other or against or on a way that is not favorable for, for one child. Because we find in the same story with Joseph that there was some degree of parental biasness I'm in favor of Joseph that led to jealousy of him by his siblings and it led to sibling rivalry. So the siblings have a part to play, but the parents in my mind have an even more critical part to play in terms of the, what is fostered among the siblings. So, so that is important. And so if the siblings play their part, as I indicated earlier on, and uh, the parents do their part as well, um, it will foster good relationship among siblings. All right, so that is um, important there. As we told, the, uh, <coughs> the, the siblings not, 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 um, not fostering this rivalry, but working as a team, and also the parents helping to foster that. Pastor Giddens, you want to add something? I mean, we, um, what role does the, the, the parents have, um, or, you know, uh, to the children, or the children to the parents, fostering good relationship there? Well, in, in the real world, uh, there are a lot of times children have different fathers, right? This is stuff I deal with ever so often. And sometimes you hear a mother bad mouthing uh, one child's father in the presence of the others. And then, sometimes in the real world, one child father uh, assists greatly in terms of finance, and the other doesn't. Uh, how that works out, that works out in a negative way in terms of these children growing up, and sometimes there's animosity uh, among them because of what the mother may be pointing out, the negatives of ex-father or wife-father. So I am here saying that it is good for child mothers uh, to keep certain information to themselves and not to share it with the children. Uh, because uh, this can bring about this can bring about turmoil uh, and disagreement within uh, families. Then too, children of themselves, siblings of themselves, as parents, uh, okay, um, a guy may choose to marry a lady who has two children already, and then he, together with her, they produce two. You have to be careful, Mr. Man, whoever you are, uh, to treat those children who the mom had before you came into their life as if they are your own. 
Now, that is very good instruction uh, for peace within that family. Uh, then two children must always be told that, listen, you're the next generation. In spite of whether your father is different to my father, you're the next generation, this group of children, you're the next generation. So try your best to see, parents must be insisting, try your best to see how you can live in a peaceful manner as you domicile together and not be encouraging the pulling together. So in terms of the blended family, parents have to be careful what information they share with the children. And uh, the gentleman who has married this lady must try his best to love the lady as well as the children she had before he got married to her. That helps a whole lot. Okay, so we, we of course, Pastor Giddens attempting to address the various situations that we find in our society because it's real you have um it is not it's not we are we are not always having the ideal situation where a, a man marries a woman and they have children from that relationship we have all kinds of relationship um relationships out there our families out there and therefore um those um tips there help to address that i i think what happens sometimes um pastors is that parents want to have the one reason they do that is to have children on the side, mm -hmm. you know? So they share some information um, to them, thinking that the child will, gra that ch children will gravitate um, to them. But um, I think that's a, it's, it's, it's a kind of selfish move because you're destroying the child for your benefit. Well, what you think of is your benefit. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't see that could be a benefit because you cannot destroy a child for, for your benefit. And I think very often parents try to take sides in this matter. So we have to be very careful with that. I think we... We did share a lot already, and relative to what spouses, Pastor Scott, you know, quite, quite um, shared earlier on, what spouses need to do for each other um, to ensure that we have, we maintain, uh, we stop the slide, you know, stemming the tide. Um, we talk about the time spent with each other, giving each other um, time, both physical time, the sexual intimacy, all of that. That is important. Yes, all of that is important, and that was shared. Uh, Pastor Scott, what do we? What do you understand by the term relationship repair? Because we're talking about stemming the time, the tide, you know? Relationship repair. And what, what are the steps? You know, relationship repair. Right. Well, relationship repair, well, it's a, it's a term that is used in psychology and it can be defined differently. But relationship repair basically has to do with restoring the relationship after a rupture. And a rupture in the relationship can be influenced by different factors, but it has to do with restoring that relationship after a rupture. Of course, there are different things that can be done, and I'm just going to share some of them that could help to restore that broken relationship that is in need of, of repair. So firstly, there must be an acknowledgement um, by the family member or the spouse who is in, in the wrong, because the, you will not make the effort to restore relationship if you do not see or take responsibility for your part or your contribution to the rupture. So there has to be that kind of acknowledgement. There are times when a spouse or family member may need to understand why, why you did this, why you operated that way. So sometimes it's not just the what, but, but the why. And so when we take the time to discuss, to communicate, to explain why I did this, why I responded that way, why I reacted that way, why I said this. It helps with the understanding and uh, the person may begin to understand better the reason. Sometimes people can hold things against you because they do not understand the reason. But when we take time to explain the why, then persons are better able to have that sense of understanding and so there's a greater desire to restore the relationship. Sometimes with all that understanding, the other party does not even want a restoration. So that kind of communication is important. Being willing and humble enough to apologize is also important when it comes to restoring relationships. Um, somebody may act like, some, sometimes people say, sorry, can't buy a pack of curry. <laughs> you know, we have that saying. <laughs> but the word sorry is a very powerful word. Um, when you apologize and you, you say, I'm sorry, please forgive me, please pardon me. It goes a long way in relationship restoration and, and restore. So we must be humble enough, husbands, wives, children, parents, 
Be humble enough to say, forgive me, pardon me, I'm sorry. It softens the, the, the heart of the other person and it opens the heart up to you. And uh, we must learn each other and we must be intentional about repairing and restoring the relationship. Also, one of the things that helps with restoring relationship is that you can have a situation where, based on studies, boredom is a contributing factor to broken relationships. And, uh, and when persons are bored in the relationship, not enjoying it, it's just a matter of time when there will be that rupture. And so we must be more proactive in ensuring that the things we, we have done to keep the relationship before marriage, they continue. And the things we have done to have a successful family life in the first instance that we get back to doing those things. Is, is sometimes I use that as if for a family life message, the story of Jesus Christ when his parents left and, uh, and he was not with them. Um, they, 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 there was that break, if you please, when it comes to the family. But the way it was restored was by them going back to the same place they left him. And so sometimes we just need to go back to doing the, the same old things that fostered good relationship. There's a saying, there's a saying if, it, if it's not broken, don't fix it. So, so whatever helped for a successful family life, we need to go back to these things because it will help to replenish, rejuvenate, um, the family, living the family life. There are some things, however, that needs to be stopped in its tracks. Whatever you realize that contributed to the breaking of the relationship in the, among the family members, you need to stop it like now. You know, in the church, we have a program called End It Now. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we need to be immediate and, uh, and uh, you not know, just get it done now. Whatever has contributed to that break, we need to make sure that we end it now by the help of God. Touch is also very important um, in terms of relationship, even when there's a disagreement. Um, touching must not just take place when husband and wives are ready for sexual activity. Um, just to, to touch even when there's a disagreement and understanding to show that I'm with you, I'm here. It has a psychological effect and it helps in terms of the repair that needs to take place in the family life. And we need to be committed to each other. Don't just be faithful to your family members in the relationship when things are going well. But even when things are not going well and they're not doing well to you, there must be that sense of loyalty and commitment. Endurance is important. There's a saying, you have to be in it to win it. You cannot get out and expect it to be See, to work out. <laughs> you must be in it to win it. So just being committed um, to the family members, that's important. And one more thing I'm going to say um, is that gratitude, l l listening in your mind the things about your family members that you really appreciate, that has been a blessing to you, will cause you to have a better spirit of goodwill. Uh, I said one more thing, but allow me to say the conflict, manage the conflict management principles are also important in terms of avoiding unnecessary conflict situations. And when there are conflict situations, you confront them appropriately, not no name callings, um, no loudness, no quarrelsome attitude, and there must be dealing with the issue, negotiating in a way where there's a win-win situation. You're not selfishly seeking I when you lose, but see how both parties and the entire family can benefit as you seek to manage the conflict. And there are times when we need to compromise um, to help in the restoration of the relationship. When we follow all of these, I believe we can restore relationships and families where they have been ruptured. Yeah, and that's a lot you spoke there. And by the way, you got to be in it to win it. It's not a lot, eh? it's about <laughs> being in the family. You have to stay in the relationship to, to win it. We're saying, um, yes, Lisa, Lisa, we recognize you from London. Um, how are you doing? Hope you're doing well. Pastor Gittins, our time is running away. Um, I, I would like you to comment on relationship between extended family. How, what, what? Extended family. Sometimes we get into families and we try to extend the family. Sometimes play a very negative role. How can we assist them? Um, before I say that... Oh, before you want to say something? I sat, no, no. I sat there and um, 
I was hoping you wouldn't ask me <laughs> because I just enjoyed listening to Pastor Scott. No, okay. Seriously, because he touched the relevant points. But in terms of extended family members and how they can affect, first of all, people who are getting married need to understand that you're building a life, a home, building relationships, you and this individual and children who uh, may come into this family. And the principle of leaving and cleaving, uh, it's, it's best done. It's easier to leave and cleave if you leave your home of origin and uh, you build with an individual. Uh, having said that, uh, in-laws sometimes play the role of outlaws. Have mercy. I do say that we must respect our in-laws because it is my in-laws who produce my wife, who I love so much. So I need to respect them. However, they are so set in their ways over the years that it's not easy for them to change to suit you. Hence, uh, it's, it's good not to live with them or live in the face uh, because when they are with you, they are going to affect uh, two, two areas jump out at me in family life, husband and wife. Uh, the presence of in-laws will affect how you deal with intimacy and how you deal with settling conflicts. And people who have gotten married, they definitely uh, will have conflicts. They will have conflicts. Uh, I normally say that it's only if somebody is a vegetable and the other person is a stupidity, only then they will not have conflicts. So long as you have a brain that is working, you will have conflicts. But these in-laws, sometimes they want you to go their way. And sometimes they pull the side. If, if it's my parents, sometimes they want me to go in terms of decision-making their way. Uh, when really myself and wife have worked out that this is the area we're going to go, that is problems. That's problems. So respect them, yes. But hey, uh, they need to stay out of your marriage and out of your affair because they will tie up and tangle up the whole thing. And after a while, you're wondering, should I listen to my wife? Should I listen to my mother? No, you have to build life together and leave them out. That's very, very important. Have mercy. It sounds very strong. Leave them out. Out, but the context context is totally meaning <laughs> because Pastor Pastor um, Giddens already said the importance of 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 the family. Folks, we are out of time, but just um, just as we conclude, we live in a very pluralistic, a post Christian world. You know, Pastor Scott, um, Pastor Giddens. You know, is, w w what what can we say? You know, is there something we can still say in as it relates to communicating traditional values? We, we, the world is post Christian. I mean, post everything. What can we still say to help promote Christian values as we conclude? Yeah, I think that there's some things um, t still to be done. We cannot just throw our hands up in the air and you know give up. Um, so, firstly, I'm I'm saying prayer is critically important because it's really a spiritual conflict. Um, the great controversy it, it happens at different levels, and secondly. Mentorship is important. We still need to, to mentor, to teach. Because people may act in the postmodern world as though they're not listening, but they are listening. And once, once, you, once you speak, persons have to think about what you said. Even if, they, even if they resist it or act like they're resisting it, when they go home, when you leave their presence, they can't help but to process it. And sometimes you help them to make the right decisions, even if it may not appear so in the first instance. So parenting children, for example, in the postmodern day and age, you, you keep mentoring and you are going to have an impact. Then modeling is also important. There's a saying, what you do speaks so loud I can hardly hear what you say. We need to model the ideals of what the Bible teaches, even in a postmodern context. And people will pick up from our examples things that they would 
demonstrate in their own lives as well, Christian values. And finally, I would say we need to be intentional, right? We need to be intentional and purposeful in terms of promoting, fostering, maintaining the Christian values even among families, notwithstanding the post-modern era or the post-Christian era, if you want to put it that way. And when we do these four things, I think our contribution to passing on the Christian tradition will be with fruit. Wonderful. Pastor Giddens, your final thoughts? Uh, um, just quickly, because I know time has run out. Um, I mentioned earlier um, in terms of the interference of in-laws, but I come around uh, speaking on behalf of in-laws and extended family members in terms of helping to promote uh, the Christian traditions. Uh, people who have extended family members who are Christians and living up to God's expectations as to how families should be run need to make sure they allow their children uh, to interact with these individuals because it takes a community uh, to really bring up a child. Take, for instance, uh, just this weekend, my, uh, one of my grandchildren was by me. Uh, once they come by me, there are certain things I pass on to them. She had to begin learning a certain song uh, before she left. Uh, so the passing on of these skills, uh, it's e Christian skills and qualities, it's easy for it to be done in the framework and setting uh, of these extended family members who are living up to Christian principles uh, to assist you in terms of doing that. I, I hear say that in this modern day and age, it, there is a controversy. Uh, the modern mind says, try out anything. However, when we are dealing with families and the family system, if the family system is going to succeed, and uh, God is going to remain within families. We have to insist and show modern families you cannot try out anything. You have to let God be the head of the household uh, by demonstrating that uh, publicly and in whatever way to, 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 to family members who you're controlling as well as to those who you speak to and show them that these, uh, these methods were tried and uh, God-fearing, uh, good citizens were produced because these methods were tried and proven and so go ahead using these biblical principles within families. Then it will succeed. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pastor Scott and Pastor Giddens, as you shared today, and Pastor Scott, stemming the tide, how to improve family relationship. We are very um, grateful for your presence, those of you who viewed and listened, who commented, and we trust that in some way, Something was said by Pastor Scott, Pastor Giddens, or even myself um, that would have assisted you in stemming the tide as the enemy wants to destroy our families. And because if our families are destroyed, our churches are destroyed, our schools are destroyed, our homes are destroyed, our communities are destroyed. But we hope that what we shared today will have been a tremendous blessing to you. Thank you again for, for listening, and we look forward for your continued support. Um, to um, our future Pastor Scott. Pastor Scott, could you say a word of prayer as we close? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the time we have spent together. We pray, God, that the viewers, that they all would be blessed by our sharing and to not only be blessed, but may they influence others to have good family lives. We pray that you bless all of the families represented by our viewers and those of us here as ministers, we pray, God, that the point shared, that we will glean them and apply them. And we pray that while on this earth, that our families will flourish from strength to strength. And above everything else, when Christ returns, may our family members and ourselves be saved to enter your kingdom. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 God bless. See you next week.